Hi everybody, this video is sponsored by a contribution from Anonymous, and here is her story. Hi Ali, I appreciate all that you're doing to help others to have a voice against narcissistic abuse. I donated to your channel, not much, but I hope it helps. This is the first time I've tried sharing my story to any real degree. I apologize ahead of time for the length of this letter. It's just difficult because everything is still fresh and there is so much to remember and remembering causes a lot of pain as long as this is. It, it's really only the tip of the iceberg, unfortunately. I was raised by a narcissistic mother and an enabling father, which I guess from what I have learned so far left me open or like a magnet to attract narcissistic abusers in the future. I didn't learn, learn about what it was that I had dealt with in my mother until eventually I married a narcissist. I married my husband in 2008 and separated from him in 2015. After the separation, after the separation was when I began to understand the things he'd been doing to me throughout the marriage. Due to the bombardment of overwhelming harassment, cyber stalking, lies, threats, bullying, and on top of that, top of all that, finding out had he'd been contacting people I grew up with, neighbors and people and people he knew with video that I did not consent to or know about. Oh, let me reread that again. Due to the bombardment of overwhelming harassment, cyber stalking, lies, threats, bullying, and on top of that, finding out he'd been contacting me. People I grew up with, neighbors and people he knew, with video that I did not consent to or know about. I figured out that he'd been recording me without my knowledge or consent for approximately seven to eight years. Everything from normal, everyday things to sexually explicit, and he'd been waiting until I would stop putting up with his abuse in order to expose me in every possible way and justify doing it in his own mind. And because he was the one doing the recording, he convinced others that he was justified to do it too. Okay. Right here, I'm going to stop and say to you, the fact that he was able to convince others narcissistic abuse abuser or not that he was somehow justified to unknowingly record you for cut every single one of those people out of your life right there now because that's that's beyond narcissistic you know manipulation that's just a caliber of people in your life that have the, some of the lowest moral code I ever heard I don't understand even even how a narcissist would be able to justify that. Sexually explicit stuff. It's not like how we record the narcissist blowing up like a, and then make fun of him and all that. Okay? If that's what he had, like stuff like that, that's one thing. How does he have how does he explain the sexually explicit stuff? to everybody he's showing it to. How is that justified? Narcissistic manipulator or not, that doesn't fly. That doesn't fly unless you are hanging around the worst kind of people in the world, which we should tell you make it very easy to determine who to cut out and cut out quick, completely and permanently. That should not need any, ex any, any explaining. Anybody who would go along with that narrative is worthless to you. Is worthless to you. I was stupid to put up with so much for so long, but this was my third marriage. And although I knew the things that were happening were unacceptable, I did not want my third marriage to fail. I didn't want to throw away my son's chance for being for a family. I wanted to make sure that if there was anything I could do to make it work, that whatever I did it was, that whatever it was, I did whatever it was. 
Looking back, I let way too much go, way too far, for way far too long. And because of that, consequences that were at one time unfathomable to me became my reality. Let me start from the beginning. Before we married, there was only one warning sign that I can recall as what was to come. One morning after I woke up, my ex showed me a picture that he had taken while I was passed out the night before where he had intentionally exposed my breast for, for the shot. I was alarmed and disgusted, enraged. I screamed at him to delete it and let, let him know how angry and disgusted, disgusted I was that he'd done that. He did erase the picture and told me that he didn't know why he'd done that, but that he would never do it again. I shouldn't have trusted him. Yeah. Yeah, for somebody to, to undress, that's, that's creepy. I mean, that was a, that's a huge warning sign. Total lack of boundary whatsoever. At the beginning of the marriage, everything seemed fairly normal. I do not remember exactly how far into the marriage I was when I began noticing odd things. I, get, I began feeling like I was being watched and like my husband knew things that he shouldn't have because they would have been because they would be about things that happened while I was alone. At one point he said to me, while I'm at work today, you should play with yourself. You know it. He's a friggin' jacker. He's a jacker. Oh God, these are the worst. These are the worst. These are the worst. These are the worst type of fucking men. They like, they just want to jack off to you. And the, Cause it's so violating and they're so weak and ineffectual and feckless. Oh, these guys are like monkeys, man. They're like little monkeys. Can't stop fucking jacking it. And this was not a one time thing. Of course not. He made his comment to me several times across the span of our relationship. So if he's not home, he's at work, and he's telling you to play with yourself so he could fucking jerk off in his office. <sighs> Jackers, man. <laughs> Jackers. Every time it grossed me out, it made my mind spin as to why it would say something like that. In early 2011, approximately three and a half years into the marriage, I woke up to my ex having sex with me, which he initiated while I was sleeping. This hurt me bad, and I cried and tried to push him off me and screamed at him to stop, but he, he wouldn't get off, and he wouldn't stop until he was finished. This was the first time that he raped me. After this happened several times, I told him that I was going to leave and I wanted a divorce. He begged me not to leave and to give him another chance and that he would do whatever I wanted him to. I told him we would have to go to marriage counseling. When we began counseling, I told the marriage counselor what happened and he asked my ex what he had, had to say about it. He told her that he didn't mean to do it and that he thought he might have had a sleep disorder that caused him to initiate sex with me in his sleep while I slept. She did not believe him. <laughs> really. I don't think anybody... <sighs> Sorry, Your Honor. It was a sleep fuck. But... <sighs> what? What? This guy's twisted, man. Neither did I. Let me further say that his story about initiating sex with me while I slept was never mentioned until that day to the counselor. The counselor informed me that in the state of North Carolina, it's difficult to prove marital rape, that if the, consent, the uh, counseling session was ever addressed in court, that she herself could not testify, but that she would type a letter for me that would be legal before a court of law, and I thanked her. Even then, Ali, I was, was stupid and took pity on him. Over time, I tried to forgive him for what he did and remained confused as to why he did it. I le later learned men who rape women are generally seeking control. 
it did affect me neg negatively afterwards. It still does. I became very unsure of myself. My confidence fell through, and I no longer felt like I could finally trust my own judgment. After that, things that had been easy for me to determine as black and white, right or wrong, became blurred. Everything became dependent on what he thought or how he felt, and it did not matter at all. Several months after seeing the marriage counselor, I'd been drinking liquor, trying to deal with what I had been going through. I began to self-medicate with alcohol and ended up with a DUI and was given a term of three years probation. My ex was the only person who I had had to help me in the state of North Carolina, so I asked if I could have my probation transferred to Virginia, where my family was, because I really didn't think I could get through the probation without my family support. My probation officer told me that I needed to get $250 for a transfer fee, and then he would put the paperwork for my in the paperwork for my transfer. After two weeks, I got the money and brought it to my probation officer. He told me that the offer for the transfer was off the table and he didn't know why. I still believe to this day that my ex went in and talked to the probation officer saying he didn't want me to leave the state with our son. There was nothing that I could do. So since I wasn't going to take my four-year-old autistic son to a woman's shelter, I stayed there through the duration of my probation with my ex. Once he knew I couldn't leave the state and had nowhere else to go, he treated me however he wanted. Like I was worthless and didn't matter. Verbal, emotional, and psychological abuse were regular, and he raped me again during that time. The night it happened, my head was so messed up. I didn't even say anything about it until the next day. Once I did say something, to my surprise, he began speaking so soft, so calmly and softly, telling me that he hadn't done that and that he never did either, and he was worried about my mind because I must have imagined the whole thing. It was the craziest, strangest, most confusing thing. I actually found myself wanting to believe him and me, apologizing to him. But then I remembered the, le the letter the counselor gave me, and I got it out and showed it to him. I will never forget what he said to me when I showed it to him. He said, oh yeah, I've forgotten all about that. I told him, you forgot about it? Well, I sure wish that I could, but I can't. And for the life of me, I don't know why, but I told him he could have the letter as proof of security, that I had no intention to hurt him or defame him with it. He kept it. I think on some level, I hope that in doing this, he would start being nice to me. Sometime after that, I began to doubt my own sanity. I felt like he was bringing it to the attention of other people and saying that I was telling people that he'd raped me and that he, had, that he hadn't actually and, that, and, that, and saying that I was lying about it. So I contacted the counselor and told her about how I'd given him the letter and I needed a copy of it. She told me that I shouldn't have done that because only the original copy could be used in court. She did send me a copy anyway for my own peace of mind. I still have it. I later found out he was telling people that I was delusional and saying that he raped me when he had not and that I had gone so far as to type up a fake letter saying so. There are quite a few people out there now who both know he and I know who think that I am just a terrible woman making false accusations about him, trying to defame him. It has been one hell of a nightmare. Also, I later realized the reason he was being so unusually calm and nice when I confronted him about the last time was because he was recording the interaction for what I believe was his current future audience. To make his story more believable and make out to be the bad person and the liar, I know that now. I was rarely allowed to use the laptop and never allowed to use the desktop computer. I cannot remember now exactly what it was that provoked me to say this but at one point I said to him if you are recording me in any way I want you to stop he looked at me and said with a shitting and grin, grin on his face the husbands who do that to their wives their wives should thank them because they made them stars I had no words I was blown away and did not know how to respond 
I was blown away and did not know how to respond, but was more in shock than anything. I felt like an animal in a cage. This guy's into all that voyeurism porn, and he might have been live streaming you on the internet for all you know. And things got so bad that I did leave and rented a room from someone in the neighborhood. And once I did, he began to be nice to me again. And I wanted to believe that he could change if, if he wanted to. And I wanted to be back with my son, so I came back. I never knew when his rages would come or over or what, and I felt unnerved and uneasy all the time. I would rather learn that he was take, taking video, which he'd secretly taken and was sharing it with people on my Facebook of me saying negative things about people I knew. What he was doing, I now know, is giving me positive attention whenever I would speak negatively of others while he was recording it and then showing it to whoever I spoke about behind my back in order to make my life a living hell, even when he wasn't around. So these people knew he was recording you and just, these are horrible people. I, I don't, like, you have to be in some kind of, some kind of weird environment with these awful, awful people. I, I just never heard of such, such people like this, who would knowingly, who would have knowledge of your husband secretly recording you to go back and show that that's just the, the most horrendous shit I ever heard. There was one incident where I learned for certain that he'd been secretly recording everything I did. While I was extremely depressed over everything that was going on and confused by everything I hadn't yet figured out, he mentioned to me before he left for work on this particular morning that I should take a shower before he got home from work. Talk about adding insult to injury. There's only so much that one person can take. I didn't say anything to him in that moment, but inside... I was fucking furious because it was how he treated me that made me not want to take a shower because I was so down, depressed, and angered by how he treated me. And then he would expect me to just want to be intimate with him. The worse he treated me, the less I wanted to be physical with him. Not to be, not to me, to the sexual abuse that he just shrugged off. So after he left that morning, I sat down and said out loud, how dare he say, say that shit to me when it's because of him I don't want to take a shower. I don't want him to touch me. That was a huge, huge mistake because he came home from work. He looked extremely pissed off. He walked past me a couple times and then into the next room and he said out loud, going to sit there and say you don't want to take a shower because you don't want me to touch you. He said this in anger and disgust where I could hear him and I was terrified. I knew in that moment all my fears and suspicions were absolutely legitimate. I did everything in my power to finish probation as early as possible. So I did everything that was required of me in a year and a half and got a lawyer and petitioned the court to allow me off probation early. And wouldn't you know it, while waiting on my case to get called and while my lawyer wasn't around, the PO, the PO approached me and asked me if I planned on taking my son to Virginia with me if my pr probation ended early. And I snapped at him that, of course I would. I could not even believe this was happening. Then he told me I wouldn't be allowed to finish early, and I just lost it. I cried and cried. I just got myself together, though, and when, it, when my case came up, the judge let me go. As soon as I got home, I started packing. I estimated how long it would take me to get everything packed and called my dad and asked him to pick my son and I up. While I'd been packing, my ex had called the cops on me, and I was talking to them outside. I kept on packing, and one of them came over to me and asked me what I was, what I was going on, and told to, and told him my husband wasn't happy because I was moving back to Virginia. That apparently was all they needed to hear because after that they both left. So that was it. So everything I so it, so I got everything that I needed to my and my son, and we made the move back to Virginia. Not so long after moving back, my ex contacted me and asked me to forgive him and if we could try again. I know, so stupid. 
So after about four and a half, four, four or five months, I could see the good behavior beginning to fade out and the bad coming, coming back. And the more of this I saw, the more suspicious I got. So I got brave enough to check his phone, which wasn't anything I had done before. I looked at his phone. He had placed his phone on the bed and went into the other room to do something. And I opened his Facebook Messenger and found where his 17-year-old niece, by marriage, was messaging him with a meme that showed a needy, attention-starved wife with the wife saying things like, Baby, can I go here with you? And can I go there with you? And example, can I get in the shower with you? He was making fun of me with her, as I now know he'd been doing for years, all the way back to when the girl was just 14 years old. When I called him on it, he freaked out and yelled, I don't want to lose my marriage over this. He slammed and broke his phone and threw his dinner plate across the room, making a huge mess, of course, which I cleaned up. I didn't say anything else about it, and I suppose I had hoped at that point that the incident would help him to realize that I had held some importance to him, enough at least to not do it again. I was wrong. A couple months later, I saw that he had accepted a new friend request on Facebook from this niece of his, and as I looked into it more, I could see that she had made a new profile and that it was the fourth that he accepted from her over time. So I asked him why, since he knew I was deeply hurt by his correspondence with her. The two of them were making fun of me in the very recent past. Why he would continue to talk to her after what happened. He told me that the two of them had been talking over the course of a few years to a 14-year-old. And his reason for this was that early on in our marriage, I realized he was venting to people who he saw regularly, and it made things awkward between me and the people who he vented to. So I asked him to vent with somebody who wasn't around us all the time. I was assuming he'd pick his brother or sister who live a state away, or a guy friend from high school, an aunt and uncle, something like that. In other words, he was telling me, based on my request, he picked a 14-year-old girl who he was very much physically attracted to. I know this because of the raw sexual comments that he made on several of her pics, and was related to only to by marriage. So I brought that to his attention and that obviously I wouldn't want him talking to her anymore if we were going to stay together since they'd been enjoying laughs together at my expense. Made me so sick. Still does. I think they were enjoying more than laughs together. The guy is an internet jacker. He's a voyeur. Voyeurs, these type of guys like young girls. Jeez. It's more than that. It's more than that. You need to be able to see this. Looking back now, I don't know why it's a surprise to me when he told me that he had no idea what I was talking about and that the incident never happened. He was telling me essentially that I imagined it all. I didn't know how to handle that, that the same man who had been afraid not so very long would go at the possibility of losing the marriage because of this what is now a flat-out denying what had happened. As much as he tried, he could not get me to pretend what had happened hadn't. I overlooked a lot throughout our, throughout our relationship. I mean a lot. But I was not going to go along with pretending this did not happen when I knew without a doubt it had and that it had caused me so much pain. This happened all right, when he was about to go to North Carolina to see his mom and dad, so I left it alone until he got until he got to North Carolina. And once that happened, then I explained how and why it bothered me so much, and I needed to know that he understood that. He continued to deny it happened. He momentarily unfriended this young girl on Facebook, one of her profiles anyway, but started ignoring my calls and texts and tried to say that he just didn't get them. And that was it for me. I realized that I was not going to have the respect from him that I deserved no matter what the circumstances were. I realized then that I shouldn't have given him another chance once I had gotten away and that was a huge mistake. 
I knew that I couldn't go through it anymore, so I told him that it was over. Little did I know at the time he'd been waiting for that moment for most of our marriage. I began to get comments on Facebook, Facebook people who I grew up with, who my ex didn't even know and had never met, who I myself hadn't really spoke with in years because I'd been living in another state for about for the past eight years. My worst fear throughout the relationship, being recorded without my consent or knowledge, became my reality as I learned he'd been sharing Pic's video would apparently spend the last eight years of my, my life. My worst and most vulnerable moments, which, had, which I had the right to privacy during all of my intimate moments. He was presenting this to people who I knew, who he knew and people that neither, that neither of us knew in such a way that whoever he showed these things to would believe that he did it for a good reason and that I deserve to have this happen to me. He planned everything perfectly all those years. I can look back now and see all the different situations and setups to where I look like a complete piece of shit of a person to everyone who saw it in the way he presented it. He was in control and knew when the camera was on. I think back now over how many years I was oblivious versus how many years I'd been suspicious, even to the point when I actually knew but didn't want to believe it. There are so many things that have been put out there that I'm embarrassed and ashamed of. One of the worst is that during the last couple of years of the relationship, he began to say a lot of racist things. Initially, I thought it was odd for him to all of a sudden start saying, fascist things to so much when he hadn't in, in the prior five to six years. But as time went on, I got used to him saying that kind of stuff. And he would be nice to me when I would talk or engage with him about those kind of things. Instead of ignoring me or disregarding me, he would engage me and I would not feel alone. I began to feel comfortable talking to him in relation to those kind of things even though I knew better and I'm not racist. I regret that I did this in order to gain his approval and some positive attention, which I otherwise would not get. I hate that I did that, and I know I shouldn't have fed into his bullshit, him and his bullshit, which he would later take the recordings of and slander me everywhere. It worked. I have been living through... I mean... I've been through a living hell all because I wanted positive attention from someone who I realize now I did not marry to at all. I just had to, I just had my own part in what, in what I had done to whoever I ended up offending. I apologized and admitted my ignorance that there wasn't any excuse for it. My ex also told people I was lying about my own sexual abuse that he caused. So a bunch of people out there believe right now, thanks to my ex, that I'm a horrible, evil person, which in reality he is, projecting all his shit onto me. So it's exhausting mentally and emotionally, completely exhausting carrying around all this with me. I remember after moving back to Virginia and foolishly giving him another chance, I had taken a nap, and when he woke up, I saw him sitting on the bed, facing me with the most evil, and I mean evil-looking grin on his face. He stared at me, and I didn't know why he was doing that. After a few minutes, he started to initiate sex with me, but I insisted on being underneath the covers, and he got angry and yelled at me that he didn't want to have sex under the covers. And I just knew. I just knew it was happening again, and he was recording. But I couldn't find proof of it, and I started crying. And he said to me that he really just wanted to be outside the covers. And I just kept crying because I was realizing the malice involved. Then he told me that he guessed he didn't realize how much that bothered me. I remember that a lot. A lot. <clears throat> After everything that happened, when I broke things off with him, and I began getting comments and remarks from people, the understanding of what he'd been setting me up for all along unfolded. From that point on, everything changed for me in such a way that I would never be the same. So I had my sister-in-law come and pick up my son, and, and I let the, let the night pass. The next morning, I took nearly everything in the medicine cabinet, as much as my stomach would hold. I locked the doors and windows, turned off all the power to the house, and lay down on my bed to die.
I tried my best, but my dad came by in time and apparently called the ambulance. I was in and out of consciousness for three for three days in intensive care unit, and they admitted me to the psych ward and was there for 10 days. Unfortunately, I could go on and on, and I apologize for this letter being as long as it is. It's just that there's so much I even... There's just so much, and even though it's been just shy of a year since all this happened, it's very, very fresh to me, and I have not yet gotten no contact due to the fact that my ex and I still have a son together. But I am understanding that I will have to soon. I feel like the little contact we do have is keeping me from moving forward, and this is why I'm reliving it over and over again. Any advice or help that I would get would be much appreciated. Thank you, Ollie, for the help you gave on your channel. Sincerely, Anonymous. That was a crazy story. But the thing with the cam is how I know it's it, it, it's it's definitely for real because that type of sickness that's all part of another sexual fetish this jacker thing I guarantee you he was live streaming that in the bedroom that last time your problem here is anonymous you start off your letter with you were raised by a narcissistic mother and an enabling father in Virginia. You meet this narcissist who's just a nightmare. He's just an effect, ineffectual nightmare, pervert, probably pedophile, total jacker online. That's what he is. We got all of that. <clears throat> He's a terrible person who will figure out a way because those jackers, they're like, they're jackers and a lot of them are hackers and they're evil, manipulative people because those voyeur types are just getting off on getting over on you. That's what all the recording stuff is because that's the manipulation. Like your old school peeping toms really had to like plan shit out to go peep in women's bedroom windows and try to jerk off. It's the same mentality. That's why this guy is so diabolically manipulative with all this. It all comes from that jacker fucking society, that online jerk off voyeur society. That all being said about him, every time you've tried to break away from him, that narcissist, where are you going? You're going back to the original narcissist. You're playing narcissist ping pong with your life. Why do you think can't deal with him. couldn't deal with you married him. Can't deal with him. They start their shit again. He starts being nice. Do you understand? Do you understand your pattern? You're a hook. You got a hook because you got a son. Do you understand? You got a hook with him because you have a son. So you're going to have to deal with him on some level at all time. You're not no you're not no contact with any of your narcissists. And what I'm going to tell you is going to scare the living shit out of you, but is the only thing that is going to help you. All these people in your life who have been bad man believe them, it doesn't matter. It's between two states on the East Coast, Virginia and North Carolina. Who gives a shit? There's 48 other states you can move to and get a fresh start where nobody knows you and get off the narcissist ping pong table. 
this is what's going to keep happening to you unless you cut off the source narcissist first, your parents. You got to get away from them. Because I guarantee you, even though you didn't go into what happened in childhood, the same shit that went on in childhood is going on now. That's why you're susceptible. Because you, now you want to get away from them. And he doesn't seem that bad. And it might not even be. He was being that nice to you. They, over here, your original narcissist when you're out, are driving you crazy again. And you're going back and forth and back and forth. You must figure out a way to change your life radically. You need to move someplace completely different. Completely different. Find a job somewhere with an opportunity. Move someplace completely different. West Coast, Oregon, California, Florida, Maine. There's a million beautiful places you can live here. Nothing's going to change for you, Anonymous, until you get off the narcissist ping pong table. And that's going to come with personal strength and figuring out, I, how do I do this? How do I move out of here now? What's my next move? How do I do it? And you figure it out and you just get it done. As long as you're sitting there, he's going to know you're vulnerable. And he's going to be waiting for serve. That's my advice for you. Thank you so much for your contribution and your story. It was quite something. It really was. I'm sorry you went through all that. And I can honestly see how it could happen. Knowing the manipulation of those jackers. But your problem isn't, isn't that so much anymore. It's a problem of what he did to you. Obviously, you got to heal from all that. It's the reason why you keep going back and forth. You're going from your original narcissist to him, back and forth and back and forth. Stop playing narcissist ping pong. So thank you again for the contribute for your contribution and your story. And I do hope this helps. Thank you to everybody watching. Uh, please leave any advice or comment comments in the comment section below. And again, if you have a story or audio or a topic you would like me to cover for you or just want to make a contribution and see the, the, the channel grow, you know what to do with the PayPal link in the description box below. I'll have the video right back to you. This is Ali Matthews. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all again shortly.